Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our, our webinar on this very special day, International Day of Peace. People are still coming into the, the Zoom room. Um, so I, I would like to welcome you, um, but take my time a little bit <laughs> so that people can find their way in. Um, there's, there's never a, a moment in history when we don't need to be thinking about peace and working for peace actively. Um, and these times are no exception. So um, we're delighted at HREA Human Rights Education Associates that you've taken some time from your day today, the International Day of Peace, to join us and our fantastic speakers to contemplate what it means to be um, living and working um, for peace. So, um, Human Rights Education Associates, if you haven't, um, if you're not familiar with this organization, is a non-governmental organization that's dedicated to the role that education and training can play in promoting a culture of peace and human rights. Um, we have an online resource center, which you're going to hear about at the end of this webinar. Um, and at the same time, we have monthly webinars linked with um, International Human Rights Days, today's being the International Day of Peace. The webinars themselves are intended to be a learning experience for all of us and um, also a way for us to think about um, what we can be doing if we are educators in our own uh, environments to promote, in this case, uh, peace. So many, many thanks um, to um, the HREA interns whom I'll thank again at the end of the webinar um, for organizing this event and to our speakers who I'll also thank again at the end. I wanted to let everybody know that we will be recording this webinar. So if you have any uh, concerns about having your image, um, please uh, keep your camera off. Um, I am um, going to, uh, sorry, I just got a message. Um, I'm going to be um, also uh, adding to our HREA listserv. Um, those of you who are not on our listserv will be added to the HREA listserv so you're informed about future events and other human rights education events happening globally. If you would prefer not to be on that list, uh, you can simply subscribe. It's unsubscribe. <laughs> it's very easy to unsubscribe, um, but we hope you want to stay part of the listserv. Um, so with that, I'd like to, uh, again, uh, welcome you and pass the floor over to Jessica. Thank you, Dr. Tibbetts. I'm just going to do a brief introduction to our guest speakers tonight. We're so happy that you're here with us to celebrate uh, World Day of Peace. And we have two really amazing expert speakers with us. Um, so we have Dr. Alicia Cabezudo and she is the um, Professor Emeritus at the School of Education, University of Rosario, Argentina, and the UNESCO Chair on Culture of Peace and Human Rights of the National University of Buenos Aires. And she's think tank member of North South Center of the Council of Europe and consultant on global education and citizenship education of the North South Center Council of Europe and former vice president of the International Peace Bureau and current representative of the Global Alliance for Ministries and Infrastructures for Peace in Latin America and the Caribbean. And our second expert guest speaker is Ms. Mary Kangathe, and she is director of the education program for the Kenya National Commission for UNESCO, former officer in the Ministry of Education at local and national levels, former national coordinator for peace education at the Ministry of Education. She's led and participated in the designing and implementation of key national peace education activities. And she is the former coordinator of the Intercounty Quality Node on Peace Education under the Association for Development of Education in Africa, Kenya. And so first we will be hearing from, uh, we will be hearing from our uh, speakers they will be giving us their presentations and we're gonna hear from Dr. Cabezudo first and then Ms. Mary Kangethe second. And after that, we'll be doing an HREA tutorial for you as well. So I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Crystal, um, who will get our presentation going for Dr. Cabezudo and Dr. Cabezudo will take it away. Thank you, Jessica. I think you need, you'll need to stop sharing and then I'll... Okay.
Dr. Alicia Capozudo, please. Yeah. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Can you wait here with this presentation, please, Crystal? Thank you. Good morning to all of you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, because uh, here are people from all the world, so from different times. But we have different times in this very moment, but we have the same hope and interesting. That is to say, to celebrate, to honor the day of peace, the international day of peace in our countries, in our regions, and in our hearts. And it is the main issue hmm, to celebrate everywhere. Um, I am here uh, representing in a way of talking from the perspective of the views of the Latin American um, dimensions related to peace and human rights. And the role that peace and human rights have for the, this vulnerable population. So let's make a very brief uh, presentation and then we go to the slides in order to show you some ideas of what we are doing, what is happening, what we are inventing in a way in order to develop uh, and to defend and to be responsible of this uh, important issue that it is social justice, peace and human rights in our, in our countries. First of all, you have to know that in most of Latin America, human rights and peace movements and even the education field emerge in conditions of dictatorship. Human rights violation were viewed as the product of authoritarian regimes. So under conditions of sweeping repression Political and civil rights, although actually separate, became indistinguishably from security rights in practice. Human rights, because of the rallying cry for broad opposition to the status quo, so human rights and peace were absolutely uh, defensive. They are resistance. So they are resistant fields to the conditions. The early goals of human rights organizations were shaped then by this reality in the continent. Strategies at the very start were directed not only toward immediate remedies, but also towards changing the larger regimes producing the violations in the first place. This setting has changed in the last decades. The new regimes are often labeled as democracies because of their electoral origins. They do allow somewhat greater political space for pluralistic political liberties, and in most cases have relied over less egregious and arbitrary repression than the military governments. But in the news, in the, these new settings, some alarming questions arose. And these questions are related to that, that democracies that we have nowadays, they uh, produce another violations or the same violations like in the dictatorship time. And this is very characteristic of the Latin American continent. I know that it is difficult to understand by the North, by the Europeans, North American and Canadian colleagues. But the reality is that we question very hardly and very deeply our so-called democracies because of the situation that it created, mainly because of the inequality and bigger and bigger gap coming from the economic and social as well as cultural rights. The process that characterized global economy at the end of the last millennium with a strong accent in concentration of wealth and a high degree in technology brought poverty and marginality in Latin America. It had increased the precariousness of the working conditions, unemployment and corruption. 
we have deterioration of institutional life and weakening of representative democracy without any mobility to switch to other participatory mechanisms in many countries. The whole have had a great impact on the social and economic spheres in the countries. The result of this situation is absolutely devastating. Disbusting. The structural poverty sectors had no substantially changed their previous situation of scarce or null participation in the distribution of wealth. Still, they are suffering deeper marginality, higher infant mortality rates, precocious pregnancy lower performance and even dissertation from primary school. We have also very deep social problems in addition with all these and so appeared and particularly in the last two years due to the COVID situation, but from before a deepen um, ranks of family domestic violence, children, citizen insecurity, addictions, environmental destruction, children's work. To this, we must add the advent of thousands of new poor people. These are unemployed workers who have lost their jobs and their social security without any alternative or any social service to assist them. The result of the policy of adjustment are very well known in Latin America. We speak about the last or lost decades that we try to characterize and with very marginal conditions. So in this situation, coming from dictatorships and entering in so-called democracies, so what we have here? Please, the next one. Crystal, yes. First of all, for making some kind of policies or pedagogies, we have to think very, very strictly in the relationships in between the content that it is what we are going to work on with these vulnerable groups, the methods and forms related to the contextual conditions. We have to relate all the time these three cycles in order to think and to understand not only conditions and, pe and pedagogies or educational programs, but all the political policies. Sometimes they are cut in between. I'm using um, an image from my colleague, Magnus Havelsrud, that, uh, that he rethink about these three elements. And these three elements have to be considered all the time. They are obvious, but they are not so obvious when we read and we see programs, particularly from the government. The next one. So the form, the way to work in this context are, of course, the praxis. The praxis coming from Paulo Freire's uh, pedagogy teach us that we have to observe the reality, we have to observe the context and the field in order to create our activities and to go to theory. And asking help to theory, we return to the reality or to the field in order to work and to intervene in it. So the relationship between theory and practice have to have to be a kind of cycle all, all the time coming from the ground, going up to the theory or deep to the theory and returning to it. So in this particular field that it is human rights and peace, for us, it's quite impossible to work only over theory and theorize all the time and to be only on the field that it is very various, very difficult to understand. So the help of theory is a need. The praxis is the model of intervention almost in all the Latin American countries related to peace and human rights. The next one. And about interventions, our 
pedagogy principles I have summarized very, very, very shortly. We need to have a holistic perspective in these fields. We have to have dialogue as the main methodology in order to interact. We have to develop critical thinking and of course, values formation. So these four elements are part of our work and it is a need to, to share and to teach to newcomers when you start working in our continent, and I'm sure in the African continent as well. Next one. The holistic perspective means this issue that I want you to highlight. The local and global dimension in formal and non-formal education practices. There is a tendency in the continent to, to study the local and to search on the local. And sometimes it is difficult to make the people extend to global issues because the local are so terrific and so complex that then they assumed that this is the main goal and they have to start there. No, we have to permanently in our methodology in working in the continent, look at the local, of course, from where we have the themes, as Paula Freire said, but go to the global to see how these global and local are interacting in a permanent uh, dialectic that explains both. So it's important for understanding to relate all the time. And so, the holistic perspective means local and global, formal and non-formal education. There is a tendency also to think that peace and human rights can be developed only in the formal. Absolutely no. We know that very well. And then all issues have to be interrelated. All level of educations have to be compromised and all sectors of society. So the holistic means not only local and global, not only formal and non-formal, but also try to deepen on these things, try to study and to research on these things with and in all sectors of society, all levels of education and all issues interrelated. The next one. Alicia, just to let you know, you have three minutes. Yes, I've seen it. Dialogue is absolutely important as a methodology that also you have to remember, which means to open to new ideas, the free flow of information, the exchange and good synergy for building new relationships. It means also dialogue, respectful learning, acceptance of different ideas and perspective, and basically, basically, participatory democracy, democratic teaching and learning, and new resources and methodologies for learning. So when making dialogue, we have to apply this and we really do almost in all the countries with different results, of course. The next one. Critical thinking. Wow, this is difficult. We always talk about critical thinking and related to human rights education. It is not so easy to build it. It needs observation, analysis, and reflection. It needs, particularly in our continent, political awareness. It needs moving your mind, heart, and spirit. It means commitment, individual and social responsibility, and mainly action and transformation. No critical thinking at that abstract level. We need to put, to embed that critical thinking in action because then we, we have the transformation. We don't step in the theory, remember. We don't understand generally in Latin America working in peace and human rights that we have to develop extraordinary theoretical papers. We think that that papers are not useful if we not translate it to actions to the ground. The next one, if I have time, hope so. The values formation, yeah, 
Yes, we know that that values are part of our human rights and peace perspective in all the sectors of the society and particularly the vulnerable sectors. Why? Because the cultural roots and early family socialization are particularly relevant in that groups. In that groups, they don't know about universal or they don't, they don't see or they are not interested, I would say, or we have, they don't reach the universal values consensus according to international parameters and legal framework, et cetera. That's something that we teach and we learn in school, but the early family socialization and the cultural roots gives us mainly the values formation. And even when you acquire the universal values, the knowledge of international parameters and legal like framework, that cultural roots are mainly the most important axis when uh, developing human rights and peace. So that is why it is in bigger letters. The next one and uh, the last one. So peace and human rights intervention in Latin America. Remember, we need we need to create political and socioeconomic awareness on reality. And that political is underlined, have to be underlined. We need to work in a level of intercultural dialogue with the need of transformation in minds and hearts. We have to understand global and locally, creating critical empowerment. We have to meet the genuine needs, themes and issues at local and global level. Not, not things that you think are the most important, but that, that it is important for the people. We have to keep an holistic perspective when teaching and learning. We have to be learning centered and mainly, look at this, we need to learn a specific skills, attitudes and values formation in all the actors of the education process of the society, government, community leaders, teachers, parents, families, students, public policies, officials, politics, religious leaders, media communicators, the whole rank of social actors at large. We have to work with all of them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cabezudo. That was wonderful. Now we're gonna hear from our second expert guest speaker, um, Mr. Mary, I'm, I'm sorry, Miss Mary Kangathe. And I have your slides right here ready to go. So Mary, whenever you're ready, I'm happy to click through the slides for you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am really grateful to have this opportunity uh, to share what uh, we have done in Kenya in regard to peace and human rights. I am specifically grateful to speak after Alicia who seemed to give quite a, a wholesome approach uh, to work in peace and human rights. Uh, and therefore, as I make presentations, probably you'll see uh, the, practic the, the practice that she has been talking about uh, in, uh, in some of the, uh, of the areas that I'm going to share. So I'm really glad uh, to come after Alicia because I think uh, the presentation really uh, connects with what I'm going to share. So I want to state that uh, my presentation is based on our, on our, uh, on our experiences in Kenya working uh, with vulnerable communities, promoting peace, uh, and within it, uh, finding ourselves also working with human rights. I am not a human rights expert. I am an educationist, but working with vulnerable communities, you realize the connection between the two and the need uh, to address the two. Uh, and therefore, I will raise issues that, uh, that are basically uh, based on our experience and uh, I, would, I would really appreciate if the participants could also uh, ask questions or, or you know, bring in the ideas that would help even shape our interventions further. So with much ado, I would want to go to my presentations. So if we could go to the first slide, please. Okay, I thought I should first of all start by illuminating uh, the profile of vulnerable populations in Kenya 
the Ministry of Education carried out a study in 2017, uh, which and the report is online, uh, just trying to look at who are our vulnerable communities. Uh, and basically, it is those who live in arid and semi-arid regions. Uh, mainly, these are mainly pastoralists. Uh, they are, the indicators of education are usually low in those regions. And we find ethnic conflicts and something we call cattle wrestling, where we have uh, like taking away of cattle. It's a traditional practice where these communities keep taking cattle from each other. And in, in the process, there is a lot of violence. Uh, then we have traditional practices where we have high levels of female genital mutilation. And we know that this practice is linked to early marriage and early pregnancies. Uh, at this time of COVID, we have had then uh, serious issues, especially in these regions. Uh, the break from school provided a lot of opportunity for some of these practices to go on. And we have seen quite an increase uh, in early marriages and uh, early uh, pregnancies uh, in our communities and in our schools. Then urban informal settlements, these are basically inform uh, settlements within the towns, but we have poor uh, people living in those areas. We also have what we call pockets of poverty in high potential areas. Uh, we specifically focus on persons with disability, and also we talk about internally displaced people and we are beginning to have a, a conversation around refugees. Uh, this is something that is coming up even within the education sector and how we integrate uh, these matters uh, within our education sector. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to also highlight uh, the fact that uh, from 2007, uh, when we had a major crisis in Kenya for what we call the post-election violence, the government went out strongly to put in frameworks and structures for peace and human rights in Kenya. The constitution, which was uh, promulgated in 2020, has a very strong bill of rights providing for human rights. Uh, then we also have some structures. We have uh, a commission, uh, which is a constitutional commission called the National Cohesion and Integration Commission. And it has really helped us to track issues of cohesion. They actually give us a cohesion index, uh, you know, regularly. Uh, they also track uh, issues of hate speech and especially around uh, electioneering period because there is a correlation between electioneering period and violent conflicts in our country. Uh, they also help us to look at uh, issues of uh, inclusivity uh, and ensuring that we focus on all uh, the members of our community without having marginalized community in Kenya. They investigate complaints of discrimination and make recommendations to authority on remedial measures to be taken where such complaints are valid. Uh, we also have the National Steering Committee uh, uh, on Peace Building, which works very uh, closely with the Security Council, but links with other social uh, people working in social uh, sectors like us uh, in terms of coordinating all of us uh, and especially around peace and human rights issues. And of course, we have the Kenya Human Rights Commission. I want to say that these uh, structures and frameworks have really helped us uh, to address matters of peace uh, and especially in terms of proactive, uh, uh, proactive approaches and trying to preempt instances of violent conflict. Uh, next slide, please. I, I also wanted to uh, zoom in to the, the vulnerable communities and looking at what we have noted as some of the issues related to peace and human rights that affect them. And one of them is inadequate information on emerging global challenges affecting them. And as a result, when, uh, when they are affected, they look at, at these issues uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in as far as they affect them and the approaches are, are usually uh, focused on the community. So, so you do not find uh, broader ways of addressing uh, some of these issues that could be global. 
and are affecting them. And we see them are still sticking to the traditional ways of dealing with this. And not to say that the emerging uh, trends like global warming have really affected the way these communities live. Uh, there is one area where we had a major conflict because they, they, there is a way the community had structured uh, a ways of working uh, with uh you you know that the way they handle their pasture and the way the the, uh, the agricultural community and the pastoralists can work together to ensure that each one of them meet their needs but when there is the, the global warming came and there was no pasture for the for the uh pastoralists then they they went against all the societal guidelines around that and there was a major conflict in that region uh, leading to loss of life we have also seen uh, weaknesses in self-efficacy skills, and it is basically because uh, of, of the, the opportunities of exposure, uh, low levels of, uh, you know, uh, education, and especially because of uh, the, the, the quality of the teachers in, in those regions. So we, we find an element of weak self-efficacy skills. Interpersonal relationships are also affected because of the conflicts, the cycles of conflicts, and therefore you find people tend to relate in their own circles, you know, as, as specific communities, and that is seen in all, uh, you know, forms of society. Even when you go to schools, you when you look at uh, interpersonal relationships among uh, learners, you still find challenges. Then interruptions to provision of basic services, health and education, when we have conflict uh, and when we have uh, uh, issues in those regions, you find sometimes children even have to stay out of school, health services are also affected. We are seeing an, emerg an emerging trend of mental health challenges and especially with COVID-19. So uh, this has also complicated uh, issues in those uh, amongst the vulnerable communities. So just like any other community, uh, any other members of the community, they are affected by mental health issues. And gender-based violence is also uh, quite prevalent, uh, prevalence in, in those regions. So if, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, I wanted to say that over and above that grim picture, there are opportunities that we note as we work with these communities. And one of them is the strong community-based structures uh, that are there, uh, the cultural practices for promoting peace, which need to be taken into consideration, and we have to consider them when we are working uh, with these communities. Then we have local community leaders that are accorded a lot of respect, and we realize that there are major uh, key milestones in promoting peace in those regions. Then we are also seeing emerging, emerging opportunities of access to information, and uh, you can see the photo I put there of a uh, of a child uh, with a gadget. So we are continuing to see uh, these kind of trends and the communities opening up. And this provides a major opportunity for promoting peace and human rights. Next slide, please. Okay, then here I want to talk about what we have done uh, with these communities. And so I'm looking at existing interventions. And I want to say that we have tried as much to understand communities. And uh, before we begin working in a community, the first thing we do is to carry out a situation uh, analysis to understand the issues that are, are affecting the communities. We have also come up with targeted peace education programs, uh, training teachers on uh, gender responsive pedagogies, and especially because in these areas, uh, you know, the, the gender disparities are relatively high. Uh, we, ha we have been integrating child protection and safety intervention, and especially around COVID-19. So this is one area where we realized that providing home-based learning uh, was one of the areas of keeping children safe. And therefore, we went out, worked uh, as government uh, with the local actors, uh, NGOs, religious organizations, to try and provide some level of uh, home-based learning and especially during the seven months closure of schools in our country. Life skills education has been mainly integrated in the curriculum. And uh, we, this is uh, one, one area where we have been trying to strengthen. We know we have challenges in terms of capacity and also the kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know how important it, it is how the important the, the level that it is given in schools you find that because it's not examined 
uh, most of the schools tend not to give it a lot of, uh, you know, to, to prioritize it in terms of delivery in schools. An upcoming approach is uh, we, 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 when we were doing our analysis, we realized that the worldview of some of the learners is quite narrow, and especially because they have very limited chances of seeing the out, uh, you know, moving outside their communities. And we are now engaging learners uh, on, on, through visits and tours to places where we feel they, uh, you know, we can have them uh, open up their worldview. Some of the places we, where we have taken learners is to the universities, where they interact with people from their communities who have made it to the universities, and also trying to show them the opportunities that are there, uh, and taking them to, and having people speak to them as they undertake those tours. Value-based education for younger children, and uh, this is because we realized that there are very a uh, few, uh, few approaches that give us very concrete uh, interventions for working with younger children. So we had uh, we have been implementing the Learning to Live Together program by Learn, uh, by Arigatu International, and of late we've been uh, we've been working with children who are in grade four. Uh, upward, that is 10 years and above, but we began to look at how we could even bring it lower to children who are six years. And uh, you can see that, that there is a photo there of a child who was trying to, uh, we were helping children to know how to write uh, daily uh, uh, memos, daily dialogues with themselves, journaling, you know, personal journal, keeping a personal journal. And I think we, we are seeing quite a lot of progress. And uh, this is something we have piloted with a few schools and we hope that we can upscale it. Psychosocial support interventions, here we use mainly dialogue sessions, uh, peer, uh, peer approaches, and of course, uh, empowering the teachers to also support uh, in provision of psychosocial support. Then uh, sometimes, but not often, we also provide basic necessities, but with this, we like working with other, other agencies, but occasionally we find ourselves providing like sanitary pads uh, and other vanities uh, that are required by the children. Next. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, the, some specific approaches uh, that we, we have, and especially within education, is capacity development of education uh, managers. Uh, this is where we have very experiential uh, training uh, with, the, with the teachers, uh, sometimes with the students. Today, we have spent a whole day with the university students, just taking them through such training. And these are uh, students who are training to become teachers. So we also empower champions, that, that is teachers and learners. We, we do peer to peer, sorry for the, for the, uh, for the mistake there peer-to-peer -peer learning with the support of teachers. We are now beginning to integrate mentorship, and then we have involvement of community members in school-based interventions, uh, uh, interventions, for example, community leaders, youth and community workers. Uh, then we are also supporting dialogues on key issues affecting peace and human rights. And I think this is something that Alicia uh, also mentioned. And we also are having knowledge exchange forums so that we can share good practices amongst members of different uh, vulnerable communities. Next. Mary, sorry to interrupt. I just want to let you know, Mary, you have one minute left. Okay, I'm just <laughs> sorry. Out. Thank you. Yeah. So if we could go, some challenges that we have seen is a low capacity of teachers in those regions uh, and supportive social environment and especially because of conflict so what we teach in school and what is happening uh, in the in the society sometimes uh, you know they do not uh, go hand in hand weak systems and structures and especially when it comes to uh, government led structures and complexity due to multiple needs among community members uh, finally i think my last slide some key lessons, I thought I, I, it's important that I also share some key lessons that we have learned. That education provides neutral ground for dialogue on peace and human rights, and especially during crisis situation. So we have found ourselves being able to engage communities who could not see eye to eye when we tell them, let's speak, how, let's speak on how we can make your children access education, and especially 
uh, when schools are closed due to conflict. Multi-sectoral interventions are critical, bringing in all the actors. I think Alicia uh, mentioned this in her presentation. And uh, also we, has, uh, we have noted that while short-term interventions assist in addressing immediate issues facing the vulnerable, they may not be effective in breaking cycles of conflict and facilitating eventual enjo enjoyment of human rights. And that's why for us, we really propagate that uh, interventions need to be mainstreamed in policy so that they can be sustainable. Deliberate effort to be made to develop local capacities for purposes of sustainability. And I think with that, uh, my last slide, I think just says thank you and uh, uh, for listening to me. And I say the Santi Sana, which is Kiswahili, thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. I appreciate both of our speakers. That was wonderful. We're going to move to, um, we're going to get into a tutorial now where we are um, going to get an HREA demo of what you can expect when you head now over we are to going the to get HREA it. Online Resource Center. Um, and this is where you can find a whole um, host of human rights education materials, podcasts, newsletters, lessons. So I'm gonna show you a brief video now so that you can access these resources um, any anytime you would like. So uh, let's just get this up so everybody can see it. And we'll do it this way. Is this visible to everybody? Okay. okay, I think this will work. Okay, here we go. A tutorial of the HREA Online Resource Center. So as you can see, I am on the home page of the HREA website. And if we look right in the center here, we have something that says Online Resource Center. So if we go to Search Resource Center, I'm gonna show you a couple ways that you can use this center to search for materials uh, for your HRE needs. So the first two options that come up for us under the Resource Center tab are searching by human rights theme and searching by target group or HRE strategy. A third way that you could search for material would be to type some type of um, term phrase in the search bar. This is also an alternative. So I'm just briefly going to show you uh, all three of these options. So if we search by human rights theme, you can see that it brings you to a page where you already have a variety of human rights themes um, categories here. For instance, um, we might want to look under things that are human rights based approach. If we check this tab, we can see that it has already filtered out any resource or material which would fall under that category. So that's option one. If we head back up to the Search Resource Center and we go to Target Group or HRE Strategy, we can see that we have um, a variety of ways of searching here as well. We have uh, Education Policy Curriculum Development, we have uh, non-formal, formal. So I may just want to click uh, education policy curriculum development, and then I might want to filter this through policies and regulatory framework. So you can see right away that this will filter the uh, resources for you directly below that. So that is the second way that you can search for materials in the online resource center. And the third way, as mentioned before, let's say you've been to both of these pages and you didn't quite see what you were looking for. So in that case, you might search in the search bar a word that you're interested in. I'm going to use peace for the purposes of our webinar this evening. And you'll see that by doing that, it brings up a variety of sources, uh, podcasts, uh, teacher training materials, lessons, um, and so much more under um, this, this term piece, this keyword piece. So now I would like to briefly give you a tour um, of a source or two, just to give you a sense of what you will find when you um, utilize one of these sources. So 
let's just take a look at this one, learning to abolish war, teaching toward a culture of peace. If we click on this material, uh, this think, we can see that it brings up a description of the source that we're looking at. So we have the author at the top, Betty Reardon, and our very own expert guest speaker tonight, Dr. Elisa Cabezudo. Um, we have the URL where this original source um, can be found. We have the target groups and categories that this source could be utilized for. And we have the languages that this source have been translated into, as well as a description. So we can see that this source, Learning to Abolish War, is a comprehensive three book packet, including a theoretical overview, sample lessons, a teacher training outline, and networking resources for peace education. We can also tell from the description that this source is a book packet that may be used for teachers, researchers, activists, policy architects, and pretty much it is applicable at all education levels, so K through 12. So in non-formal as well as um, formal and community-based peace education. Another thing that you'll see is that we've also um, uploaded all of the files here. So you have the source in Albanian, English, French, Russian, et cetera. So you're welcome to click on the file as well as head to the URL link where you can find the original source material. Um, and then you may download um, for your purposes. So I'm gonna show you one more resource, um, which is if we head back to our resource center and we type in peace again, uh, I'll show you one other type of source uh, so you get a sense for the variety that we have here. So when we look um, just under that original source we were just looking at, we have something titled Peace Education Handbook for Educators. So if we click on this link, again, um, we have a similar um, uh, description of the resource um, and we can see that um, this is um, written by the International Falcon Movement, the Socialist Educational International. And we have the original URL link for the source here. We have the target group, as well as a subcategory that this may fall under, the language that the source is written in, and of course, the description of what this source, um, how this source could be applied. So we, if we read here, we can see that the International Falcon Movement, Socialist Education International, um, is an international educational movement working to empower children and young people to take an active role in society and fight for their rights. Um, and most specifically, um, if we look down below, we can see that this handbook is full of educational activities for educators to use in the member organizations, all based around peace education. The handbook includes sections on understanding conflict, transforming conflict, making peace, all with activities that would be applicable for a range of different ages um, and might be used in camps or seminars or peer education um, or for just a workshop. So again, as always, we have a downloadable file here and of course the original link here. So those are two types of resources that you'll find in our online resource center, as well as three ways that you can search for a resource in the center. Additionally, this is a good time to point out that we also encourage you to submit resources to the website. If you have a resource that you think is valuable for human rights education, peace education, you can just follow our submit a resource link here and it will take you to this page where you can fill out the applicable information as well as check keywords that apply to the resource you're uploading, um, whatever type of HRE resource you think that this is, and further description here. You can type up a description and upload the file below. And then once you do this, you can click submit and your resource will be added to the HREA Online Resource Center. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, thanks everybody. So that was a little uh, tutorial on how you can access um, many, many educational resources through our HRE Online Resource Center. So 
Now we're gonna head on over to our Q&A session and I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Crystal, and she is going to get all your wonderful questions going with our speakers, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. And um, also many, many thanks to our guest speakers for the wonderful presentations. Um, I'm sure that just like myself, every one of us just can't wait to get engaged in the conversation with Dr. Alicia Kabuzudu and Ms. Mary Kangazi. So in the next 15 minutes, we'll have the Q&A session. If, um, if you have any questions or topics of your special interest, please share with us on the Jamboard. So first of all, I'll very briefly introduce how to use the Jamboard. Now you should be able to see the link in the chat box. Um, thank you for my colleague for sending it. Please click on it so that you'll go to the Jamboard page and um, as shown on the shared screen. When you want to write something, you'll just need to find the menu bar on the left and click on the button called sticky note in the middle of the bar and type in your question and then click on save. So um, your sticky note will show up on the screen. Um, as you can see, many questions are popping up on the screen. And on the left, actually, we have already um, prepared a few colorful sticky notes. Um, these are actually some of the questions people submitted when they registered for this webinar. We put them here as example initially for you to um, to know this idea. And at the same time, I want to invite our guest speakers to start the conversation from these very good questions. So let's see what people have asked in the registration. First, look at the yellow ones um, on the left top. Um, many of us come here for the common interest in the role of human rights education in promoting peace and the role of peace education in upholding human rights with a focus on vulnerable populations. In the screen, um, sticky note, some of us as teachers and educators are particularly concerned with how to support children and young people through peace and human rights education, especially in the context of um, classroom settings. And some of us highlight another general focus, which is the context of peace and human rights education, as it is so important to the educational practices. Okay, while you are still um, dropping down your questions on the Jamboard, I'm passing the mic over to uh, our guest speakers, Dr. Alicia and Ms. Mary. Either of you would like to go first, please just pick any of the questions I um, just repeated. And, and also, could you please answer the questions very briefly so that we can have more questions addressed. Thank you very much. Well, if you want, Miss Mary, I can I can start. Do you hear me well, all of you? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So uh, I want to make a comment first that it is related to the both presentations. And I want to, to ask the, the attendants of these uh, presentations to think about the uh, communities that they have. Because describing the reality of uh, the schools and the teachers and the students in Africa, it is important to say that they are that problems that were um, highlight, but maybe they were the same problems in Latin America. I mean, we have to think when teaching peace and human rights so, so hard in the characteristics of the context, because the characteristics of the context, remember, are going to guide us in order to develop the curricular design, the methodology, the resources, the didactics, the, 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 all the, the, the issues related to the process of education. And I was uh, really thinking all the time while hearing Mary about that she is describing Africa and it is like describing some countries of Latin America. So how this context uh, formats in a way, the way that we have to work 
on human rights and peace in our countries, that I want to point this issue to the attendants first. And the question that is left is how, how role does human rights education play in building peace? Yeah. And I'm going to answer it very quick. Uh, it is fundamental. It is basic. We can't think on peace building without human rights education. Because without the guide, the principles, the ethics of human rights, how are we going to build peace? It's impossible. In a, in, to my students, I usually say that in, in a way, peace and human rights are the two faces of the same coin. I mean, it's impossible to work alone. We have to connect them. That is why I was so happy to see that this uh, event today is really gathering both because that is the way that we have to develop our work. That's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, I would want to go to uh, some questions that are specific for Kenya. I see one from Katie. I'm happy to meet Katie again. Uh, that what how do uh, how do I see the education the ongoing education reforms in Kenya uh, uh, impacting on uh, life skills? I think uh, that we Kenya is going through a curriculum reform pro process and they're basically uh, moving to a competency based curriculum. There has been a lot of effort towards that. Uh, a new curriculum framework is in place, maybe just for people who may not be aware. And I think for us uh, who are especially in uh, life skills and skill, I mean, and value based and life skills, uh, this is a great opportunity. Uh, and especially because in our curriculum framework, uh, we we were in a position and we, we were able to identify the core values, something that we hadn't done in our previous curriculums. So the core values are very well uh, uh, specific, uh, brought out, the, the, the thematic areas are well brought out, and therefore you find these are now deliberately integrated across all the subjects. And uh, while we know that we have a challenge to empower our teachers, we believe that in terms of policy shift, that is a major one and we are expecting that is going to have an impact in the way uh, we promote life skills uh, uh, in this country. And uh, we are already beginning to get good feedback from parents. And we hope that as we move forward to the higher grades, we are going to have a better impact. Then uh, I want to also respond to the question on how uh, the methods that are best for implementing peace into the curriculum. I want to start by just putting a word of caution that from my experience, this is both a procedural problems in a, a police a procedural issue in terms of the procedures that need to happen within government structures and also a political process. Uh, for me, the hardest part is the political part of it. And uh, if you can be able to deal with that, then the procedure part becomes easy. So there is need to think strategically in terms of people who can support you as you are moving towards uh, implementing peace education into the curriculum. Are there people who can engage uh, within government and show the importance of it? I can tell you, uh, in, in 20, uh, before 2007, we were approached uh, by U UNHCR because they were doing a peace program in our refugee settings. And uh, the government said, no, we do not have a problem of peace. But when we had our uh, crisis in 2007, they started asking, where is the peace education program? So they were now reaching out to UNHCR. So I want to say the political process is important. And I think that needs to be very well thought in for people who are outside government and also people who are within government. For us, what we have done, because we are like champions within government, we have always tried to make sure we have champions within curriculum and we have uh, champions uh, uh, within curriculum and also uh, in you know the, the government agencies so that then when we begin those deliberate discussions, uh, then we can uh, be able to have uh, uh, people who support us. So I think that's what I would want to say for that. So it's good to be aware of the processes that are, are need to happen within your country, but also be aware that it's also a political 
process. I think that's what I would want to say, unless uh, Crystal would want to highlight other questions we could respond to. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, um, um, Ms. Mary and Dr. Alicia. And um, we're seeing a lot of questions are growing on the screen. And also there are some questions that are um, calling for responses specifically. So um, could you pl um, please pick the question, one question because of time limit um, to address in this session. Dr. Alicia, please. Yeah, uh, there is an important question that it is related to what uh, Ms. Mary had said about methodologies and political issue. There's a question about uh, how are the, what are the best methodologies in order to empower vulnerable people? Mm -hmm. And what is the role of uh, peace and human rights education in this? I, again, I highlight the issue that uh, um, these themes, human rights and peace, are part of the dignity of the human being. <clears throat> so when you work on these themes, you're working with the identity of people and you are affirming their, uh, their sense of being a um, subject and not an object. You know that very many times the vulnerable groups and the vulnerable peoples, children and youth are considered like objects by the politics, by the governments, or even I have to say sadly, by even the educators. So to talk, to work, to make projects on peace and human rights, to learn about the substance of these concepts is to empower these people in order to defend themselves, to know that they are subjects, civil subjects, citizenships, and they have to work for that that they are useful, that they are needed in the society and their role is important. So this empowerment, that the education, uh, the human rights and peace education have an important role in this empowerment of vulnerable people. So we have to remember that very well. And uh, related to the methodology, I, I have heard, but uh, not so clearly, so I repeat, the issue of participation, that it is related to this issue of dignity and uh, being a subject and not an object. I mean, the way that the people participate in uh, human rights and in peace issues give them strength in order to participate in other issues, in other aspects of their life. So in a way, learning about human rights and peace, they are learning how to be a good citizen, a good person, a good family member, a good social member. And that is absolutely important. Thank you, Dr. Alicia and Mary. Um, Ms. Mary, could you please pick just one question to respond? Thank you. Yes, I, I really am sorry we can't respond to all the questions and they're quite interesting questions that I see uh, in the sticky notes. I want to speak uh, to one that's asking about NGOs working on economic, social and cultural rights and how they can infuse peace education into their practices. First of all, I want to say, uh, I think what we have learned is that our interventions, and I think this is something we've learned over time that our interventions can both address uh, bring about peace or they can exacerbate conflict. Uh, and I think for me, it, it, it was in books until one time uh, we built a school in one of the communities and it became a source of conflict because the, the other communities around felt that this community had been favored and therefore that, that school was destroyed. Our children lost their lives in that school. So while there were good intentions, then you find it really 
turned out to be, be a source of conflict. So I want to say for all NGOs, it's go good to make sure that you do a conflict analysis of the interventions that you you are carrying out. They they may be well, uh, good, they, they, you may have very good will uh, as you implement, but are they ex exacerbating conflict? But in the way you are rolling them out. And probably I may not be able to talk about that here, but I would ask that you read literature on how you do a conflict analysis. Uh, you can engage experts. And I, I think for me, that's an important starting point for any NGO that is working in this area. I also want to say it's good to integrate uh, experts uh, in peace education. And I think you can integrate elements of peace education in, in quite a wide, wide range of interventions, even if there are cultural exchanges, there's a lot of uh, uh, peace education that happens when children learn how to appreciate each other's culture, each other's religion, uh, and even community members learning uh, to see how they can uh, have those exchanges. Uh, one of the areas in Kenya we found there are very uh, few exchanges is uh, the way we see religion. Uh, and how people learn about each other's religion. So there are quite uh, uh, there are many opportunities within uh, work that we do amongst vulnerable communities. Uh, even if we are not directly focused on peace and human rights, we could still integrate uh, activities that are, 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 are geared uh, towards that. So I hope that helps. Uh, and I, I think I would want uh, to uh, probably, do I have more time, Christo, to respond to one more? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Alicia and Miss Mary, for this inspiring conversation. It's such a rewarding experience to learn about your amazing work at the intersection of peace and human rights, and also very appreciate the chance to interact with you all on the International Day of Peace. Um, now I'll pass it to Jessica for the for the next part. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal and Dr. Elisa and Mary. Um, I, I also second um, my colleague Crystal's comments. It's been such a pleasure to have you. I just wanna point out before we wrap up with Dr. Tibbetts uh, that we have some um, links here as well as um, QR codes that you can scan. We have two um, items here. We have a feedback survey. So if you'd like to leave us any feedback on um, events you'd like to hear about in the future or topics you're interested in or just general feedback about this webinar. We also have a link here um, as well as a QR code that will take you to this takeaway flyer. And if you put your phone up on this QR code, it'll pop the flyer up on your phone for you. And then each of these icons will take you to one of our social media platforms where you can stay informed about upcoming events and our monthly webinars. We have a Facebook page, a Twitter page, a LinkedIn page, a website, of course, YouTube. And then there is, of course, the um, HREA info email. So thank you again for coming. And I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Tibbetts now. Thank you, Jessica. And thanks so much to Dr. Alicia Cabiz Cabizudo and Ms. Mary Kangate. Uh, I'm just so delighted that both of you could join us today. And I, I ex because of the way that you were interacting with each other, Alicia and Mary, I could see that you also really enjoyed being with each other on this platform. It was so interesting, so complimentary, and also really inspiring. I, I personally really appreciated the both of your focuses on politics and processes and, and context and the real work that has to be done, not only in thinking about pedagogy, but also thinking about having human rights and peace education happening in very specific environments. So, so thank you so much, warm welcome, uh, warm thanks to both of you. And a thank you um, to also um, Jessica, Crystal, uh, Stella and um, also Serena of the HREA team who pulled together this webinar. Um, my, I'm grateful for the wonderful work that you all did with the speakers and with the Online Resource Center. So um, HREA does a monthly webinar linked with one of the International Human Rights Days. Next month, we'll be having a webinar um, for the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. That particular holiday, if you will, is on a Sunday, October 17th, where you're gonna have a webinar either that Monday, the day following, or that Friday before. So please keep an eye out. We'll, 
make an announcement in a few weeks on the HREA listserv. Um, we do record and archive on the HREA website all these webinars. So um, I just think I saw a question about whether or not this is going to be recorded and made available. Yes, it will be with also with um, transcription. So if you go to the landing page of the HREA website, you will find um, a link to uh, future events, which will be our upcoming webinar and past events, which is an archive of our previous webinars. So again, many, many thanks um, to our speakers. Um, and for all of you who took time out of your day to help us celebrate and learn about peace during this International Day of Peace, thanks so much. And we hope to see you in our next webinar. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.